You're you're all good. <laughs> How's it good. Go? We have um Doors of Lander in tomorrow. So um uh just preparing for that race. And then after that we have Flanders and then depending on Perry Roubaix, maybe a week of break. So hopefully getting either a race Perry Roubaix or a good training block. But um the sun finally came out in Belgium after months of cold and rain and wind. So I'm <laughs> very happy. <laughs> What's, uh, yeah. how long have you been over there for? Are you living there or just for the races right now? We're living here in an Airbnb for two and a half months. Um, okay. so because we're an American team and we have people from all over, we just rent an Airbnb for like a two month race block. And then we do the classics and then we kind of disperse. And then we come back for the summer for the course and Giro, and then maybe stay through our dash which is unclear depends on what gets mm -hmm. canceled or not but right. it's usually like a two-month race block um so so this is actually super interesting so i'm just i'm gonna do the intro in a second but i'm probably gonna leave this in just as a heads up because so what's your rate when you said race prep for tomorrow what are you guys doing what are you looking over the course team stuff whatever you can share without giving yeah out it's evolved secrets. a lot over the last two months, um, when I came to Europe, I didn't have any race prep really because I didn't really know what that entailed. Um, so I only started racing professionally in September of last year when I did our dash. Mm -hmm. So I'd never done any American pro races because of COVID. Mm -hmm. And so I went straight from kind of 15 girl local races to the European Peloton. So when I came over here, I didn't know the names of any of the people I was competing against. I was way in over my head. I didn't know the courses. I had never ridden on cobbles. I never tried to position in a Peloton. Everything was just way new to me. So um, when I came over here, my race prep was just like, try to maybe learn a little bit about the course. And then I became so obsessed with studying the course that I didn't spend any time on studying the competition or the riders or the racers from other teams. And so now i think i'm starting to learn a lot more about what goes into preparation so at this point what i do now is i go through the race course and i mark all the critical points and the climbs and i'll usually try to look it up on google street view um if i haven't done a recon so i can see what they look like mm -hmm. and what the sharp corners look like and look for you know markers on the road and then i go through the start list of all the teams and all the riders and try to figure out maybe who they're riding for what are the riders' strengths and weaknesses? If it comes down to a bunch sprint, who's who they're gonna be racing for? It comes down to a climb, it splits, you know. Um, and then recovery. So I make sure we typically get a massage the day before the race, and I try to think about what sections of the race are gonna be the hardest for me and which sections are gonna be really important for me to focus on and be towards the front. Mm -hmm. And then usually we have a team meeting the night before in the morning up to talk about strategy and the course and the wind and the weather. So that's another thing we look at is the weather and crosswinds make a big difference, which again, I never really had to deal with in the U S. Oh man. I had oh, crosswinds. I didn't know what crosswinds meant. And it's funny because the first amateur race here, usually in the Southeast is this race called crosswinds classic. It's like 15 miles an hour, 20 miles an hour. We went to tour in New Zealand or tour south and they call it in New Zealand. Whole different ball game. We were getting <laughs> yeah. blown to bits. I was in the gutter. Like there, there's no way I'm not about to get dropped. Like physically, you can't pedal as hard as the five people working together as a team ahead. And they know what they're doing. And we were all a composite team. We were not gelled together. And it was like, see ya. See you guys at the finish line. That was, I had never had, yeah. I was actually in a break and with one guy and when we got caught by 10 people i was like oh i'm just gonna jump on this thing could not even get on just like yeah so that there is so much that you just dropped on people in the first minute of like wow they're doing a lot before a race which is phenomenal for people to hear <laughs> because we're in this culture where it's like oh it's just watts it's just my ftp and then i go race and so now someone can listen to this and be like oh that's that's a great summary of like preparing for a bike race so that's a, that's a that might be the best start to a podcast we've yeah had. <laughs> so <laughs> and i think it's very different in the u.s i mean in terms of the the difference you know i think in in the u.s there's a huge emphasis on fitness and i think in europe there's a huge emphasis on positioning in the peloton mm. and those are just two very different cultures and you know i think americans do very at least american women do very well in time trials um typically internationally because we tend to be very fit that's what we focus on but 
when we come over to Europe, we usually get slaughtered right away when it comes to positioning in the Peloton. So that was something I've had to really focus on the last six months is just making sure that I know how to move to the front to do so safely and that I don't get completely overblown by the stampede of lead outs before a critical point. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting point. And Stephen Bassett was actually talking a little bit about the difference in European and American racing. And I think one thing that's analogous for racers that are coming up through the U S amateur system is sort of like when they, you can race as a four and a five and even sometimes as a three, just super fit. And then when you get to the point where everyone's pretty close together, that positioning matters, knowing the course matters, knowing all these things you just listed. So that's really good for any racer, whether they're trying to go to Europe or just trying to get better here that they can apply. But so to give context, this always used to be, I thought the easiest question is the hardest question of the day. This is kind of where we'll start it to give context for people. So like we jumped in deep, who is Kristen Faulkner? <laughs> um, I was born and raised in Homer, Alaska. So I'm the fourth of five kids. I come from a big family. I love the outdoors and I've always been an endurance athlete. So I was a swimmer when I was young, won the state championship in swimming when I was 10 and then um, <laughs> did cross country running and rowing in high school. I rode at Harvard uh, varsity rowing team. And then I moved to New York to do venture capital after college started cycling there when I was 24 and caught the bug pretty quickly. And for me, it was a way to get outside. I think growing up in Alaska, I was surrounded by the outdoors. And when I moved to New York city, I just needed to be in central park every day because mm -hmm. I was surrounded by buildings. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was more of a way to escape to the outdoors and kind of get my fix of sunlight. <laughs> and then when I moved, I moved to California uh, to work at a different firm, but still in venture capital. Uh, to me, I really wanted to be on a small team of uh, employees. I think the first company I worked at was great, um, but it was a very competitive culture. And I really wanted to work under a female mentor. And that's something that still is important to me in cycling is just um, being around a lot of really strong female role models. And then after about a year of cycling in California, doing some local races, Linda Jackson reached out to me and she was the coach of TIPCO. And so that's how I ended up joining TIPCO. Um, but I can, yeah, add some more fun facts about myself. That's... Um, I broke. <laughs> no, go ahead. I was, you know, I can add any fun fact you want. You can throw them at, at me. You want more of a, well, let's know. This is of so, myself, but that's you, my story. What do you think? So uh, when you're, you move out to California, you're still, so you're trying to, you know, be mentored more at this new company and is cycling, is it still just, Hey, I'm going outside and riding. I like being outdoors and this is my connection to it. Had you got any inkling that you were really good at this yet? Or was it once you landed in San Francisco? So I had won one race in New York city that was significant for New York city. And it was the Dave Jordan classic. Mm -hmm. And I basically, I think it was five or six laps of central park. And after the first lap, I broke away and I stayed away and there were some pros behind me and they tried to catch up and they couldn't. And so to me, that was like a big victory, but it was also a classic American victory. Like you win in a break and the Peloton doesn't catch you and it's pure mm -hmm. fitness. So, you know, um, when I moved to California, I felt a little nervous about racing, um, because, it's more of a scene in California. There's um, just different types of races in different places. There's more criteriums. And so I did some local races in California. I think I moved out there as a cat four, cat three. So I did some local races that I won and started to build more confidence. And then I went to Chico stage race and this is on my I list to talk did the about. time trial. Well, yeah, before, so I before you tell people what happened, before you tell people what happens though, <laughs> what's the mindset going into Chico stage race? Cause you're still not, this isn't a diss. It's just what you are a newbie. Like you're from what I gather, just looking through the results and like your progression. It's like, Oh, I'm going to go to Chico stage race. Like still new in the sport, like clearly learning a ton from the women around you. And then you can tell the story of what happens, but what was your mindset going into the race? What were you thinking, expecting, hoping? 
I had no idea. I was weighing over my head every time I went to any race. I mean, my coach was like, try to get as much exposure to non-local races as possible. So for me, I was working super hard during the week. And then my weekends, I would fully dedicate to cycling. So I was willing to drive however far I needed to. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when I went to Chico, I think it was the biggest race up until that point that I'd done. And I didn't know much about any pro teams. I didn't know what to expect. I just was like, this will be a great chance for me to get experience. And that was it. And then the road race happened right away. And there was an echelon in the very beginning. And I was positioned in the back of the Peloton and I got completely dropped. And I was like, okay, that hurt. (laughs) I had no idea. (laughs) Like I had never seen an echelon in action. I was like, these people are way better than me. I am way in over my head. And then the time trial came and I had never done an aero time trial before and or on an aero bike and I had just bought an aero bike I think that Tuesday or, and got it fit for me that Thursday and then race on it on Saturday or Sunday or something so a time and, tra- aero bike you mean an aero road bike or a time trial bike sorry a time trial bike okay okay just so I've never ridden on a time trial bike <laughs> so amazing. I had yeah so so I bought my first time trial bike um it was too big on me it was too big for me but I bought it on Tuesday so you're like yeah. laying, laying out like sprawled out on this thing yeah. So I, I bought it on like Facebook marketplace. Cause I was like, I want a TT bike. And <laughs> I was like, I'll probably, you know, be good at TTs given my fitness. So it's worth the investment. And I have Chico stage races this weekend. So I bought a bike on Tuesday, got it fit for me on Thursday and then raced on it. Yeah. That weekend for the first time, I think I trained on it once or twice and I did the time trial. I got fourth behind three 2020 girls. And later when I was on a group ride, one of my best cycling mentors today came up to me and I was like, hi, I'm Kristen. Nice to meet you. And he goes, yeah, I know who you are. And I was like, oh, and he goes, you have the worst TT position I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, I was at Chico stage race and I saw you and you got a great, you know, you got a good result, but the worst position I've ever seen. And he's at the oh next great in TT God. positioning. Um, you know, he's helped uh the woman's champion of pan ams with her tt positioning and um and yeah he was just like you know it's impressive that you did well given that you obviously had no idea what you were doing um so i think that in some ways was incredibly humbling but also gave me confidence that it, i had potential if i could work on these things and i think that's been true as i've come to europe you know i am still a very new racer i make a lot of mistakes i don't you know up until maybe two weeks ago, I didn't really know the names of 80% of the top 30 racers in the Peloton and what their strengths and weaknesses were. I just would go into a race and try to race hard and not be stupid. And I think as time has gone on every single race, I'm becoming a little bit more strategic, a little bit more tactical and learning how to race smart as opposed to just race hard. And, you know, in the beginning I could get away with making a lot of mistakes because I was fit. And I think as these races get harder and harder, you know, I can't, I A, can't, can, I won't continue to progress unless I start learning these things, but also every time I learn them, my results gets better and better. So it gives me a lot of hope that, you know, I can continue to progress and move forward, which makes, gives me a lot of confidence. That's huge because, and you rowers, you guys are aerobic monsters or the Nordic skiers, or I've either been friends with, ridden with, coached, whoever experienced some athletes that come over to bike racing and the dance is a little bit different and the fitness takes them a certain distance. And then when they start having to make these adjustments that you're talking about, they sometimes struggle through with it. And like, why is this not working? Like, well, you can't, you, it, this isn't just a fitness contest like this. And I love that you're saying this because there's so many little pieces to a bike race that, and you got to get a lot of them right in order to win, let alone not get dropped when you start moving up the ranks and going outside your pond, like your previous coach had said, or current, go get as much exposure as you can. And I think that when you're going out and doing that, an athlete like yourself, you get shredded in the road race and people are just like, nah, this isn't for me. Or like, I'm just not good enough. It's like, no, you are. You just need to dial in the next piece, the next piece. And it doesn't just all come together. And I think it's awesome to hear an athlete at your level say that, that hopefully amateurs that are crossing over into cycling, I feel like cycling continues to grow with gravel and and whatnot. 
Um, if you don't find success right away, you got to keep going up to bat because nobody started as a cat one or as a pro or as a cat two or whatever your goal is, you know? And I think it's easy to get frustrated with ourselves when we're in this, like, I want it now. And it just doesn't work that way. So what do you think is, so now you're yeah, in Europe. I mean, it's definitely. I, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, it's definitely, you, you have to take it step by step. I think it's very easy to get really overwhelmed with how much you have to learn when you take the leap from the U S to Europe. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, you know, the field sizes grow from, you know, in the women's field, it might be 20 people in a race, maybe 30 max in a local race in the U S and it's 170 in our last race here. And so it's, you know, the field size is big. People ride really close. The people from Europe are used to bike handling skills from a really young age. And so they feel comfortable riding aggressively and shoulder to shoulder. And a lot of Americans just aren't used to that. And so their instinct is to be safe and kind of retreat towards the back of the Peloton and like give up that spot. And you just have to every single race focus on one or two things that you can improve on for the next race and just take it step by step and for time that will help and it's a much better approach i think than trying to take in everything at once because it's just way too much to learn all at once um, but i do think there are things you can do to help you know in the u.s i think going on group rides for example is a really good way to get used to riding in a pack riding close to people I was terrified of bunch sprints when I came to Europe and I said, I'll never be a sprinter. Like there's no way I'm a sprinter. Mm -hmm. And in my last two races, I've finished towards the front of the pack in a sprint just because I've gotten more comfortable being in close quarters with people who are going fast. So again, you know, it's, I'm still figuring out what kind of rider I am because as I become more comfortable in different situations, I'm showing different strengths that I didn't know I had, or even different weaknesses I didn't know I had. I had so the type of rider I am over here is very different in some ways than the type of rider I was in the U.S. What are some other tips that you would give to people that are fearful of a group ride because I just had a conversation with a guy who is stronger than his category and his biggest thing is he will go to the back and then just pass everyone when he needs to but now as he's getting in bigger races he's real realizing that um he can't just, he's not gonna be able to waste that energy as he moves up. So what do you think are some ways that athletes can work on this? Or what have you done besides just riding in a group? Or is it just that, just keep going to races? What would be some tips that you, besides like riding in a group or showing up and racing and trying to get comfortable, what would you, do you do anything else to get more comfortable? Any like drills or is it just purely experience, do you think? I think trying out different types of riding. So go to the track, try cyclocross, try gravel, try a TT bike. All of those things will help you feel more comfortable in different positions. You know, in gravel, you get, it's more like the cobbles, you know, you get used to the bumpiness and in a TT bike, you learn how to really use your core and engage your core. And, you know, I think practicing descending and crits really help you with cornering. And so I think putting yourself in as many different situations as possible really helps. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is I would say, mix up your training as much as possible. You know, if you do your five minute efforts on the same train every single time, then you're only gonna be good at five minute efforts in that scenario, but that's not what happens in a race. And so, you know, for me, like my coach will say, if you have a 10 minute effort, don't start it at the base of the climb, start at five minutes before the climb, because that's where the lead outs really begin in a race. And so in a race situation, you need to start your efforts five minutes before the climb, because by the time the climb comes, people will have already been going hard for five minutes. And so you can't, you can't expect to just start hard. You know, you, you need to practice starting a climb on not fresh legs. And so I think, you know, practice riding in a crosswind, practice sprinting in a crosswind, practice, um, you know, trying to go in your TT bike in a crosswind or a headwind or a tailwind and get, get used to how that feels different. And I think that will give you a, you know, better bike handling skills, but be a greater sense of confidence because you're like, oh, 
I know what this feels like. I've been in this situation before. I can do a five minute effort. That's a combination of gravel, uphill, downhill, flat, crosswind, rain, whatever it throws at me because I've practiced all those things before. So I think that is both training your body, but also training your mind. That is awesome. Let's give a shout out to your coach. Who is your coach now? <laughs> Mike Sayers. He's wonderful. He's awesome. Really wonderful. I love that. And I've had people that will be like, okay, well, there's this five minute climb in the race. And I'm like, so, okay, so it could be seven minutes. Right. And they're like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, what if people take off before the climb starts? Or is it a false flat at the top? What if people are going hard after the climb? Like you can't just look on Strava and say it's a five minute climb. It could be 11 minutes. And they're like, damn. And I'm like, so that's, you got to be varied with the train. Like we're definitely not just going to be hitting five minute efforts like that. I think race specificity is very good, but I think sometimes now we're getting too specific and then it throws people for a loop. Like, wait, the climb's not for five more minutes. Why are we going hard now? So that is coach Mike. I love that. That is phenomenal. Another thing. Sorry. No, go go ahead. You know, another thing people forget is that oftentimes when you hit the crest of the climb, when you get to the top, that's when there's splits or single file and people are starting to break. And so you need to crest as hard as you can. And if it's flat at the top or if it's a downhill, you need to be able to send as fast as you can. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes when we do efforts, we might finish at the top of the hill and then go easy. But if there's a way to time yourself going uphill and then straight downhill or uphill crest and then down the other side, you know, time yourself doing that because it's not just about the uphill. Like you will miss the break if you're not cresting and descending really fast. Mm. And a lot of people think it's just about the uphill, but it's about the crest and the descent because that's where you either catch the front group or you don't. So that's awesome. What's what do you think are some when you move from rowing to cycling? You know, you went from like super experienced athlete to then you're learning the cycling side, but you're super fit, which is not always common for cyclists. Were were there any things that like you brought with you that you still use in your training, like things you were doing in rowing that have helped you still in cycling? Absolutely. Both from rowing, but also from my professional career, there's been a lot of things that have crossed over. So from rowing, you know, for me, I think it's knowing how to breathe and keep my body relaxed during a really hard effort. Um, And that's particularly important on the bike because a lot of people get really tense and they tend to grip their handlebars really tightly. And in rowing, you know, I had to grip my oar with relaxed arms, you know, and I had to make sure that I kept my upper body relaxed, even though I was pushing as hard as possible. And so I think that whole kind of kinesthetic body dynamic, breathing, relaxing, Tell us about the breathing a little bit more. Are you doing exercises or is it a mindful technique of how to breathe or go in on that a minute? Yeah, it's during the race, just being very conscious of making sure that I'm breathing deeply and not like breathing super fast because that's one way to keep your body relaxed. And even during training, you know, I'll be on Zwift and sometimes I'll put on a really calm song (laughs) and I'll do that. I'll do that in effort to a really calm song because it's just, okay, I need to focus on breathing during this really hard effort and staying calm and staying relaxed. And I think that's something that I did sometimes when I was on the rowing machine, the ERG, but it's also something I do on Zwift sometimes is, um, you know, I, it's not just about pumping myself up. It's also about how do I keep my heart rate as low as possible while going the highest wattage that I can. And that comes from breathing. That's all. I'm actually not a fan of getting pumped up before a bike race uh, because it like more, I feel like maybe wasting energy, but I'm more like, I don't know, I want to be calmer. And there was a, there's a company from Denmark that I actually started chatting with. This is probably a couple years ago. They have a breathing device and it has taught me how to, I don't know if, I guess it would be calmer, but deeper and more fully when I'm going hard. And I, I emailed them back and I was like, how have I never been doing this? And like, it has been a game changer for me, especially as I get older, I'm 39. So it's like, I'm supposed to be seeing these decreases in VO2 max. And I'm like, I feel stronger than ever, mainly because I'm not like, (laughs) like freaking out. It's just like a different person. That's okay. So I never thought about that with the rowing and the grip and because you guys are full body, which is, you know, Mm -hmm. different. It just sounds like a brutal exercise, (laughs) a sport. Yeah. But any other things that, that cross over that you think of? 
um I mean just the grind you know it's you know effort after effort you know the training the waking up early going it going outside whether it's rainy or windy or snowing or hailing and just getting your workout done you know <laughs> I rode in Boston on the Charles River so in the spring it was snowing for races and the fall it was snowing for races you know there were days when I couldn't feel my toes and we still worked worked out and did our workout and I think you get a lot of fair weather riders and cycling who might not want to go do their efforts if it's raining and when I moved to California that first winter I think February it rained like 80 percent of the days in February and I was just went out every day and it didn't phase me so I think that's another thing is being you know um, resilient against whatever weather conditions come and just knowing how to put in the work and do it and you know, with work, I was waking up at five 30 to get in my workouts before work started at nine. So just that discipline for sure. And then I also learned a lot of things from work. You know, I was talking about this the other day, uh, with someone, but I worked in venture capital where we invest in startups, which are very risky companies. They're early stage. They're usually two people, you know, two founders, and we're typically the first money that invests in these companies. And so everything has a risk reward ratio and opportunity cost. And so when I'm on the bike, every single risk that I take, whether that is a safety risk or a performance risk, you know, do I chase down that break? Do I not? Do I ride on the outside, you know, close to the curb? Do I not? Everything is a risk adjusted assessment. And I have to make hundreds of those during a race. And you have to think, you know, is the risk, you know, worth this reward? Is the trade off worth it? What is the opportunity cost of me sitting in the back versus wasting a ton of energy to get to the front? Um, what is the opportunity cost of me going up the side when it might be, you know, less safe or less stable? Um, what is the opportunity cost of me putting out a ton of energy just to stay at the front if it means I have to pull, even though I shouldn't? Mm -hmm. So there's constantly trying to weigh the those during a race. And then as a new rider, you don't always know what the risk is from a performance standpoint or a safety standpoint, you're constantly figuring that out. So I think a lot of times these tactical things I never had to do in the U S because races weren't as strategic and the small things didn't matter. You know, if you started to climb five feet or 10 feet back from the person in the front, it wasn't a big deal, but in Europe, it's a huge deal. Mm -hmm. And so you just have to always be aware of every micro decision that you're making in a race. And my venture capital experience certainly taught me how to do that well. Micro decisions with macro results, that is for sure. You, you mentioned the word, word resiliency and there was a quote of you somewhere and you were talking about having imperfect days or sometimes you're maybe unmotivated or, you know, uh, it might've actually been related to COVID and just how it really changed things up what's some of the tactics that you use when you wake up and it's that crappy day and you're like, I don't really want to do this. I know I should do this. And it's not that you're tired or that you're overtrained. It's just like, you know, we wake up and we're like, Oh God, I don't want to do this. What are you telling yourself? Or how do you get over that hump? What's the carrot that you put in front of yourself to say, I'm going to go do this today. I know I'm going to be better off for doing it. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, sometimes I, <laughs> so I'm a very, uh, I'm very hard on myself. I always have been. I think it's part of being a high performing, high ambitious person, uh, kind of type A. Um, so I have to remind myself all the time of, okay, I maybe didn't hit my effort by, and I was one watt lower than what I was supposed to be, but it's not the end of the world, you know? So um, similarly on days when I wake up and I don't feel great, one thing that helps me is thinking about all the other times in my life when I woke up, didn't feel great, and then had a great workout, or I woke up, didn't feel good before a race, and I still finished. And it typically, you know, there's that quote, I think Eleanor Roosevelt or someone said, you know, the only thing to fear is fear itself. And I think oftentimes the dread I have about a workout is so much worse than the workout itself. And, um, you know, I've done so many workouts in my life that I've built up this pattern recognition of just knowing like, it's not usually as bad as I think it's going to be. And the more I sit here at home and dread it, the more, you know, burden I'm putting myself through because 
the workout's probably not going to be as bad as I think. <laughs> so that's mm -hmm. one thing is just reminding myself how many workouts in my life I've done that I didn't want to do. And I still came out fine in the end. Um, the second thing is sometimes if I do need an extra, mo you know, a bit of motivation, knowing who to call and just having someone to call. And I think having a support network is something that I didn't invest a lot in before. Um, and I really invested in a lot since I became a pro athlete, because when I'm away in Europe, you know, it's just nice to know that I have people back home that are supporting me and I can call. And so I have a support network in my professional life and my personal life and my cycling life. And sometimes I'll just be like, okay, I need to call a friend, you know, I need to do something to distract myself and that helps. And I think the third thing that I do is sometimes I'll just take a little bit more time before I start my workout. So if I always start at 10 AM and I'm really not feeling it, I've learned that it's okay to give myself an extra hour, maybe have an extra cup of coffee, maybe meditate for a few minutes before like do, you know, do what I need to do to feel good before I go out. And that doesn't mean procrastinate for six hours, but there have been days where I've shifted my workout to later in the day because I just woke up and I was not I just wasn't feeling it right yet. So I think if you'd asked me a few years ago, I would have said, I need to do every day at the same time. I need to start at the same time. You know, I was super strict. And now I think learning to listen to my body has really helped me and learning how to be easy on myself um, has helped me be a little bit more flexible. Mm, that's good. I like that.